The suffragette campaign was a campaign that was against the conservative establishment, whereas the white feather campaign was part of the establishment, uh, yet both were part of what some historians have seen as a, a deliberately uh, provoked sex war uh, between men and women instigated by, by these women. They faced an even worse death on the home front if they didn't go and face death from a bullet on the battle. And that death was, you know, the possibility of ever having a woman's love. And out of that book came one of the suffragette mottos, which was votes for women, chastity for men. Everyone today thinks they know at least a little something about feminism, and that little that they think they know is almost completely wrong. Hi, Janice. Hi, Tammy. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Good. So, so uh, I'm excited about our conversation today. Me too. Yeah, we're going to be talking about Dame Christabel Harriet P Bankhurst. She has quite a name. Yeah, quite a name. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk about her and her mother, Emily, uh -huh. who is also a very interesting person. In fact, the whole Pankhurst family is, is pretty interesting. This family, the Pankhurst family, especially the mom, Emmeline Pankhurst, and the daughter, Christabel, although um, Emmeline had two other daughters who were also very much active in the British feminist movement, they are now, I'd say, lionized in Great Britain. In uh, 1999, Emmeline was named one of the 100 most important persons of the year by Time magazine. And she and Christabel in particular, the other two daughters were Sylvia and Adela. Um, there was a complicated relationship with those daughters, but Emmeline and Christabel in particular led the radical arm of the suffrage movement in Great Britain. They called themselves or were called the suffragettes, a term that was sometimes used derisively to belittle them. Um, and we'll see that maybe there were some reasons why they deserve to be belittled. Um, but they are now, I would say, um, lionized as uh, heroic martyrs for the women's rights cause. Uh, I think it's generally considered that Emmeline and Christabel, who led a, an organization called the Women's Social and Political Union, were responsible through their militant tactics and their passionate devotion to the cause were responsible for bringing women the right to vote, which they achieved in 1918. Now, I'm going to argue that, in fact, um, and other historians have suggested, they may actually have delayed the granting of the vote to women uh, through their violence and their hysterical agitation. But um, I, I, I think they won the day in terms of the historical record. Uh, there are statues to Emmeline and Christabel in London, uh, if you read uh, mainstream texts about them, the emphasis is very much on their heroism. Um, historians will say things like uh, they were passionately dedicated to the cause of women's rights. And they were passionately dedicated, so, so passionately dedicated that they were willing to uh, carry out a, um, a terrorist bombing and arson campaign that spread fear and uncertainty throughout Great Britain for years. What year was that? They, the Women's Social and Political Union was founded in 1903, and it really became radical around the year 1909, 1910, and especially in the years leading up to the First World War, like especially from um, 1911, 12, 13 in there, they were setting off bombs regularly. Uh, Where'd they get their bombs from? Oh, well, they, they had friends in uh, uh, various, uh, you know, labor and agitation movements. Uh, this was a period when terrorism was certainly not un unknown in the British Isles. 
there were terrorists on both sides of the Irish conflict, the Catholic and Protestant side. Uh, there were terrorists amongst Marxist and anarchist agitators. So they had friends and allies uh, in those movements. And, and they learned to make, um, you know, fairly basic bombs. They, um, one uh, type of explosive that they used was in, in uh, letter boxes, mailboxes. And, you know, this is often referred to, uh, you know, as if it weren't really a big deal, just kind of a nuisance. They, they would put, um, they would mix phosphorus with sulfuric acid. I'm not quite sure how they did it exactly, but when combined together and especially then when mixed with oxygen, this would ignite. And uh, so you, you often read that they, they um, carried out letter bombing campaigns so that they set post boxes and post offices on fire. It sounds sort of, well, a nuisance and, and perhaps not what one would advise, but uh, understandable given their passion for the cause. But in fact, it was a politically uh, useless and very dangerous campaign method. It meant that often when um, postmen were uh, dumping out letters um, it, when they were, had taken them back to the post office to sort them, uh, they would spontaneously go on fire. And this caused serious burns to, um, you know, to, to uh, postman's hands. And these were working class men. Uh, they weren't in any way responsible for the ills of the society that the suffragettes were protesting. Um, but they were the ones that were put in danger. Um, many postal workers had their hands seriously burned. There was a quite famous case where um, a, a large uh, number of bags of letters on, being carried on a train went on fire. And uh, the, the, you know, the force of the ignition was so powerful that the whole train carriage went on fire. And the postman who... Um, seized the bags at great peril to his own life while they were burning furiously and threw them off the train in order to pre prevent the entire train from going on fire. Uh, he was seriously burned as a result. So, so this was the kind of thing they started doing in and around 1909 and, and carried on for the next number of years. And they, um, just to back up a little bit, uh, this was all under the direction of Emmeline Pankhurst and, and then her daughter. And uh, they had grown tired of the what they felt was the slow pace of reform. And they were dedicated to the idea that women should have the right to vote. They were not, they were not interested in the fact that actually it was a very cumbersome process to get a bill passed through the British House of Commons and in the years leading up to the First World War, Great Britain had a lot of other issues that it was dealing with that seemed far more important to the parliamentarians than uh, women's voting rights. Uh, there was um, real, a real threat of civil war in Ireland at this time. They were wrestling with the question of Irish home rule. Uh, there was a problem with the colonies, especially with the colony of India breaking away. Uh, from the British Empire. There was a lot of violence and unrest there. There was a lot of unrest at home amongst the, the poor of, of England. So, you know, there were really pressing problems. And um, how many men had the vote by that time? Yes. Did all is, men? No, they didn't. That, and that's the other issue. And, and to me, this is the thing that galls me about the, the movement itself, and especially the way the movement is now remembered all men did not have the right to vote. And there was a process going on in Great Britain at this time, there were sweeping democratic reforms, but it was happening gradually. And you, I've never encountered in reading uh, anything written by the suffragettes, I've never encountered any concern expressed for the poor working class men who didn't have the right to vote at this time. So the way it worked was that from starting in the beginning of uh, the 19th century, like right up until 1832, only a tiny percentage of men in Great Britain had the right to vote. I think it might be 3%, something like that, upper class and, men. And, yeah, upper class, right. Yeah, they were the ones that, that voted. 
And then in 1832, the first reform bill was passed to extend voting rights. And at that point in 1832, about one in six men then had the right to vote. So it was a massive expansion, but it was still only one in six men. And those were, they would be men that, that met certain property and income qualifications. Then in 1867, a second reform bill was passed to expand voting rights again. And this time they were expanded to working class men in urban centers, or at least men in urban centers. Again, though property and income qualifications. Then in 1884, a third reform bill extended the right to vote to rural men. But again, there were always these qualifications so that at the time the suffragettes were agitating about 40 percent of poor working class men in Great Britain still didn't have the right to vote and these women were not very interested in those men at all they were interested in having the vote extended to women and um, they formed this radical organization the women's suffrage uh, Women's Social and Political Union was a women-only organization, and they were very determined that um, they would bring the country to its knees if it wouldn't um, accede to their demands. And so their motto was deeds, not words, which reminds me a little bit of Antifa, or, you know, or something like that, by any means necessary, that idea that because they believed that their votelessness was such a serious injustice, a kind of systemic violence, to use the language of today, that any action they could undertake would be justified in order to rectify that injustice. And so, so that's what they, they set about doing. And they did really radical things. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, when we first started to get the vote for men, um, I read, I can't remember where, but you might know more about this. Why did men start to need the vote? And it had something to do with if it couldn't be negotiated, if whatever it was, if whatever issue was brought up couldn't be negotiated and there had to be conflict, it was going to be the men who had to go into the conflict, so they were allowed to vote on it. Yeah, well, that is has always been, I think, uh, a part of the rationale for why men had the right to vote and women didn't in the 19th century. Um, it, there was the understanding that the the ballot was a kind of metaphorical bullet, and that if the ballot failed to resolve disputes, whether those were disputes within the nation or whether those were disputes that had to do with the country's you know, international relations, that it would be men who would have to bear the brunt of conflict. Of course, it, it affects women as well, but uh, in a very different way. So, and, and this was often an issue that was raised when um, women who were agitating for the right to vote would speak to parliamentarians. They would ask them, well, um, the right, with the right to vote comes implicitly the obligation to defend one's country. Are you willing to fight to defend your country and potentially die or be maimed? And usually uh, suffragists would kind of uh, shirk the question by saying, well, we would always be against war and uh, women's involvement in, in uh, the democratic process would be against war. And as we've seen over the last hundred years, women have failed to prevent war uh, and yet still have not taken their fair share in the horror of war. So this is a kind of a sore point, I think, with um, not with, I don't think there are very many people around now who believe that women shouldn't have the right to vote, but it's a sore point around the narrative that this was this terrible injustice to women and that for, especially the idea, and I had this idea, uh, you know, even as a PhD interested in women who wrote about social justice issues, I had the idea that men had 
just sort of always had the right to vote. I certainly didn't connect it with the obligation to defend one's country. And, um, you know, I just, I didn't understand that larger context. And I especially didn't understand the very slow uh, pace of extending voting rights to all men. So, and, and this uh, was federal vote. This was a federal yes. vote they were looking for because they yeah. had they had local votes already. Yes, they didn't did. They? They, they yes, women had for a very, a very long time had had the right to vote in uh, municipal elections and and uh, for school boards and and things like that. And it was part of the idea, which now seems old fashioned and insulting, but um, was generally accepted in the nineteenth century that that men and women occupied separate spheres. Men were the ones that were out in the world outside, and that was a dangerous world often. They did dangerous, dirty, unpleasant work, many of them. And um, women were in the home, uh, often pregnant, often nursing, uh, looking after children, and the household economy, just keeping a household going, was incredibly complex. And it was thought that women didn't have the time or the energy or the interest really to care very much about, um, you know, economic matters and international affairs. And many of them didn't. In fact, I think the evidence, I haven't really researched this intensely. I have a friend who's, who's looking into it, especially in the American context, but he feels strongly that the evidence indicates that most women weren't interested in the right to vote. They were interested in bread and butter issues Uh, You know, they wanted their men to earn a living wage, so they were quite closely affiliated with their husbands and fathers and sons' political concerns. But, um, you know, being involved in that world, it was essentially middle class and upper middle class women who, um, you know, wanted really to compete with upper middle class men, and they often weren't particularly interested in the everyday realities of life for the mass of, of, of people. As, so, as we're seeing today, right? We're seeing today that this uh, radical left um, ideology comes out of the universities, comes out of the, um, the upper class Mm-hmm. Yes, and middle it, it, class, but not the working class so much. No, no. I mean, that's the strange thing that has happened to our politics is that um, conservative politics or or um, political movements on the right, which are now you know they are traditionally associated with the upper class, but it's now often people who are just basic working people concerned to keep the state out of their business, concerned by the radical ideas that are being taught to their children, right from grade school on up, concerned with social unrest and crime that affects them much more than it affects uh, upper middle class people, uh, that those are the people now who find that their only home really is kind of on the right side of the political divide because the left seems to have been completely taken over um, by intellectuals uh, and other radicals. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, and that so that was you know that was mm-hmm. partly an issue with with the um, WSPU um, that now Emmeline Pankhurst herself, just to give a little background about her, she actually came from quite um, poor origins. Her father was a just a, a, a laborer who had worked himself up um, from from nothing really. Uh, He had been at the Peterloo Massacre, uh, where British troops opened fire on protesters who were asking for uh, certain reforms. So he was a a working class man. And she so she came by her um, sort of radical politics. Honestly, her both her parents were very interested in uh, socialist ideas and, and sort of working class revolt. She was a brilliant woman from all accounts. Um, She started reading at age three, Uh, you know, by 10, apparently she had read Homer's The Odyssey and, you know, she was just brilliant. Her mother read her from uh, the American classic Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is about the ending of slavery and uh, about the evils of slavery. And uh, so, you know, she was really interested in social justice ideas. And by the age of 14, she was um, 
uh, absolutely smitten with the women's rights cause. She was born in 1858. So by the 1870s, she was joining suffrage organizations. And, um, and, and I think, you know, for somebody who from an early age um, really cares about issues of justice and then to suddenly begin to see that you are yourself a member of an oppressed group or at least to believe that you are, that can be an extremely powerful, all-consuming kind of thought. And I think that's what happened to Emmeline. She just, she became like so passionately caught up in the idea of her own unjust exclusion from spheres that she believed she could have made a contribution to. She became fired up with a kind of holy outrage and that really then took effect. She, she married a, a radical lawyer and they had um, a happy home life. They had five children, the three daughters and two sons. Um, but after her husband died, he died in 1898, she then threw herself into politics and into this, this cause. And um, she had been involved in a, a peaceful a moderate suffrage organization, but she broke with it and founded her own. And then, you know, she just, she got involved in, in this deep radicalism um, at the worst point in uh, the WSPU's militancy, they were setting fires and setting off bombs. They burned down country homes. They destroyed ancient churches. Uh, they physically attacked police officers and politicians. Uh, there was at one point, it, it seemed, you know, just no, um, you know, no point that they, they wouldn't venture to. There's a very interesting book, by the way, I don't know if this will, will be clearly seen, but uh, it's, it's by uh, a guy named Simon Webb, British author, uh, and it's called The Suffragette Bombers, Britain's Forgotten Terrorists. And he makes that argument that although if you read mainstream accounts of the suffragettes, they're quite glowing and, and admiring, but that these were actually terrorists. And he has a, um, I couldn't remember all these myself, but I'll just read it out. He, he talks about their decision to, to target what they considered to be high profile uh, buildings and uh, so they, they, you know, they burned down uh, parliamentarians' homes. Uh, at one point, uh, the British uh, member of parliament, David Lloyd George, he would eventually become prime minister of Great Britain. But at that point, I think he was chancellor of the exchequer. He, he was having a home built for himself and his wife, and um, it was partially completed. The suffragettes set off a bomb, number of bombs there in his house, and uh, it was just before the workmen were to arrive in the morning, and fortunately they hadn't yet arrived. The force of the blast um, blew the, uh, the roof in and caused the walls to collapse, and fortunately nobody was killed, but that wasn't through any foresight of the suffragettes, it was really just luck that there weren't people working in there. And then this is the list uh, that I got from Simon Webb's book. These are other high profile targets. And, and this is mainly in the years 1912 to 1914. They attacked the Bank of England, St. Catherine's Church in London, Britannia Pier in Yarmouth, Abertchill Castle in Scotland, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, Westminster Abbey, and Rosslyn Chapel. They also chose more practical and strategic targets, including railway stations, canals, greenhouses, aqueducts, dockyards, military barracks, refreshment buildings, bridges, golf course, lawn bowling pavilions, sports facilities, and hotels to name only the most common. So, you know, there, this was uh, a true terror campaign. And what's often said about, you know, in, on the few occasions that historians actually mention these facts, often they don't. I just read um, an online article called 10 Things You Probably Don't Know About the Suffragettes 
I thought, aha, here's somebody who's going to lay bare the reality. She doesn't, doesn't once mention bombs. Hmm. So that's um, not a few bombs. That's a lot. That's it's, many bombs. it's an awful lot. Yeah. It was an awful lot. And they did other, you know, ridiculous things too, like smashing shop windows. They would go up and down streets, smashing the windows of small shop owners. What that had to do with gaining the right to vote is anybody's guess. Uh, they essentially acted like the mafia at some points. They would go around to shop owners asking them to put suffragette insignia in their windows to show their support for the suffrage cause. They And they had a really elaborate um, like PR campaign, essentially. They had certain colors that they chose that were associated with the cause. They had uh, like cards, they had flags, they had scarves. So they had all sorts of paraphernalia that people could wear or display that associated them with the cause. Um, and uh, so they would offer to shopkeepers that they could display suffragette stuff. And um, if they refused, the implication was that their windows would be would be uh, broken. And uh, so, so when people do mention the violence, they often say, well, it was violence against property, as if, you know, that's not quite so bad as violence against people. But um, that's not true either um, in the cases where they attacked country homes of parliamentarians, even if the person, you know, the parliamentarian himself wasn't there. Uh, often there were servants living in the servants' quarters to maintain the homes, and there was no concern for their safety or well-being, and also, of course, no concern for what would happen to these people when, if the home burned down and they were no longer employed, or what happened to the shopkeeper uh, who had to stop his business, or you know, somebody who worked in that shop, or, or anything like that. And um, so, yeah, it was it was. Um, quite a time, and they did actually engage in physical assaults on individuals as well. Uh, at one point, um, a suffragette went to Dublin and uh, attacked the Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith. He was in an open carriage riding through Dublin with an na Irish nationalist MP named John Redman, and he was uh, celebrating a home rule bill that had just been introduced. And this suffragette threw a hatchet at Lloyd George's head as he drove by. It narrowly missed Asquith, and it, but it sliced off the ear of MP Redmond. Uh, so, you know, that was the sort of thing they, they did. And, and the very next day, uh, Herbert Asquith was supposed to be speaking at a theater in London. They firebombed it, lit it on fire. The entire uh, theater burnt down. People were in it. They, they did manage to escape, but they could well have been caught inside. Um, they did all sorts of crazy things like that. And, and that had um, nothing to do with them getting the vote. No, none of it. It was just, it was terrorism. It, it was the attempt to draw attention to their cause and to terrorize the country so that people would, would give in, essentially. And, uh, you know, combined with that um, reckless disregard for the, the safety of others, suffragettes were also quite in love with the idea of their own uh, martyrdom. They, they wanted to provoke violence against them so that they could use it to further their cause and to bring sympathy towards them. And that's often the thing that historians who are sympathetic to them will emphasize, the things that were done against them. So for example, they would hold these very large uh, meetings, rallies outside in the open air, and sometimes people would attack them. And you can understand why people were getting a bit fed up. These were the same people who had destroyed the shops and, and set off the letter bombs and everything else. And now they were holding a rally outside and proclaiming the justice of their cause. So sometimes people would gather and you know, angry 
uh, often I think working class men uh, would gather and and would would uh, either physically attack some of the the speakers or some of the protesters. Sometimes they would throw you know eggs or rocks at them, things like that, and that would always be publicized as evidence that these innocent women who were just standing up for their rights were being attacked. Uh, and and it was a perfect argument because people do tend to feel aghast when a woman is attacked. And uh, so, you know, it was, it played into their claims that women needed the vote in order to protect themselves and other women from these types of men. And so that was the sort of argument that one often heard. Uh, the other side of their longing for martyrdom was that when they were arrested for some of their bombing and arson activities or for public disorder types of uh, crimes, uh, they would go on hunger strike in prison. And they got the uh, prison authorities and the government, of course, um, into a terrible bind in that they, they, you know, they were horrified at the thought, probably genuinely, but also politically at the thought that these women might starve themselves to death. And, and it's clear that a number of these women were quite willing to do that. So at first... No women starved to death, though, did they? <sighs> hmm, that's you know a good any? question. I, some of them, I think, did die as a result yeah. of the, what they had done to their bodies, but no one so actually... So they weakened them, yeah. They weakened right. themselves so much, mm -hmm. and often they were continually re-arrested, and so they would, they would go on a hunger strike, get to the point where they were you know, near death. The authorities would then release them from prison... Uh, then they would either go back to their law breaking and be rearrested, or in some cases they hadn't yet served the full sentence, so they would be rearrested and re-imprisoned in order to serve out their sentence. That was also used against the authorities. It was called the Cat and Mouse Act, and suffragette sympathizers created all sorts of propaganda around this cruel practice of releasing them when they were ill from self-starvation and then re-imprisoning them. But, you know, what, what could the authorities really do? They were doing all of these dangerous law-breaking activities. They couldn't just leave them. Um, anyway, they, you know, so that, so that it became a propaganda nightmare for the establishment and it became a, a propaganda coup for the suffragettes. Uh, another thing that happened is that when this kept happening, the authorities thought, well, we're, we're going to force feed them while they're in prison. And so they did. And that became a propaganda tool as well, because it was it was horrible. It is horrible to be force fed, to have a tube tube forced up your nose or down your throat to to give you uh, sustenance. And that's what they would do. And so suffragettes then created a campaign where they would show images of women having that done to them. And it was like a kind of you know, it was almost like a, a, a rape by the state. It, it was horrific to see it and it galvanized sympathy for the, for the suffragettes. And so, you know, they, they were, they were dedicated, they were um, ruthless and, and they were also uh, Emmeline and her daughter in particular as the, as the leaders of the movement, they were, they were brilliant. They, they knew how to manipulate public opinion and they were willing to sacrifice themselves to a large extent uh, for the cause. And, uh, and the most famous example was um, uh, a woman named Emily Davison. She, um, nobody knows exactly why. She'd been in, in prison a number of times. She'd gone on hunger strikes. She was a well-educated, obviously intelligent young woman. She had a degree from the University of London. And um, she decided that she would make a statement by running out at the horse race, the Epsom Derby. It's not clear whether she was actually trying to do something like um, some people think she was trying to put a suffragette flag uh, to pin it to the reins of the king's horse. Um, but anyway, whatever she intended to do, or maybe she was just 
wanted to sacrifice herself. Uh, but she ran out. The horses were, you know, thundering around the track, and uh, the horse, the king's horse, ran right over her, and uh, the jockey nearly died. The, the horse somersaulted and landed on top of the jockey, um, but he, the horse, had had um, had had kicked this this young woman, Emily uh, Davison, and she died of her injuries later. She had already been involved in, in a great deal of, of violence. Um, she uh, is almost certainly one of the bombers of uh, David Lloyd George's country home. Uh, she had attacked a Baptist minister at, at one point because she thought he was David Lloyd George. I'm not sure why they especially hated David Lloyd George, David Lloyd George, but they seem to. And um, so she, you know, she was a hardened uh, militant and she died. And uh, there was a huge public funeral and procession through the streets of London. Uh, you know, it became a uh, cause celebre. It was used by, by the suffragettes to, um, you, know, you know, really promote the idea that uh, this was somebody who had died because of the cruelty of the laws of England, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, they, they, um, they were a very... Um, uh, very aggressive, very determined lot. And uh, it's not clear whether that was what brought the vote to women. Probably not. Um, it seems that the vast majority of people condemned the violence that the suffragettes were involved in. And um, what probably brought the vote to women most quickly was the fact of the First World War and the fact that, uh, interestingly enough, Emmeline and her daughter Christabel suspended their suffragette militancy as soon as the war was declared. They then began a campaign to mobilize men for the military and to bring women into um, working in munitions factories and that sort of thing. And it was that, it was women's war work that um, really swayed the parliamentarians. Uh, they knew uh, as the war was drawing to a close that they wanted to extend the vote to all those men, nearly 900,000 men had died um, on, the, on, the, on the fields of Europe. Uh, in the trenches. And so they wanted to extend the vote to those men who were still voteless. I mean, in, in a way, they might have used that argument that it was the men who had, who had really suffered. And so again, you know, the, the, the war might have confirmed that idea that it is men who ultimately bear the, the burden of the country's defense and therefore men who should vote to direct the country's affairs. But they didn't. They decided to extend the vote to women. In 1918, they extended it to women 30 years and older. And that was because so many men had died on the battlefield that if they had given it to women at the same age as men at age 18, um, the women would have been the majority of voters. And they didn't think that made much sense. So uh, it wasn't until 1928 that the vote was extended to women at the same age as, as men. Now there's an interesting um, follow-up in a way to, to all of the militancy of, of Emmeline and her daughter, and that is that once the war with Germany began, and Emmeline um, in particular became a rabid patriot uh, utterly dropped her former hatred of the government and became, you know, passionately on Britain's side in this, what she saw as an existential battle with, with Germany. But at the same time, the suffragettes involved themselves in something called the White Feather Campaign. Many of the, and nobody knows the exact number of, of women who were involved as suffragettes. So it, it's estimated between about 2,000 and 5,000. Over 1,000 women were imprisoned uh, during that time of the bombing and, and arson campaign. 
So, so it was a small but still significant number, much larger number of women were involved in more moderate suffrage organization. And um, so they began then to, to uh, engage in something called the White Feather Campaign, which is almost never talked about by historians who are interested in these figures. But Emmeline was deeply involved. Christabel, I'm not quite so sure of, she had had to leave England in uh, the final years before the First World War in order to avoid arrest. She'd been living in, in uh, France. Um, but the White Feather Campaign was, um, it began with a small group in a port city. Uh, and uh, it, um, I think it was Folkestone was the city it started in. And uh, a, a small number of women led by an older admiral who was very um, anxious that the war be vigorously prosecuted they started handing out white feathers to any men that they saw who were not in military uniform. And obviously this was intended to encourage the men, I guess you could say in a, in a nice way to sign up by shaming them. The white feather was obviously a symbol of cowardice. It came from a, a novel that was popular at the time called the four feathers, which was about a man who he was involved in, um, one of the uh, colonial wars of Britain. And uh, he, he dropped out of the army just before a major battle was about to be prosecuted. And, and his, his comrades in the army gave him three of those feathers to signify their disgust at his cowardice. And the fourth feather was given by his fiance when she found out what he was. And so it was a, an, it's a novel about the absolute, um, the necessity for men to sacrifice themselves in order to prove that they aren't cowards. So the white feather became a way that um, men were forced through sexual shaming by women to sign up. And um, it was carried on throughout the entirety of the war, even after conscription had been introduced. So there was no need because it wasn't a man's choice anymore. But it was obvious that thousands of women, maybe probably tens of thousands of women, some historians have estimated, involved themselves in this throughout you know, all of uh, the United Kingdom. And they would give the, so the feathers to very young boys. Uh, sometimes they gave them by mistake to um, soldiers who were on leave. There's a famous incident where um, a, a white feather campaigner gave a white feather to somebody who was on a train. He was just going off to receive um, a, a gold cross for his heroism in the battle. Uh, um, there's a famous incident of a white feather being given to a man who was home who had had his hand blown off in the trenches. and. Uh, that he was presented with one and it, um, it was remembered with a lot of bitterness by men after the war because it was such a clear assertion of women's power over men and their willingness to send men, men they knew and men they didn't know uh, to potentially to their deaths. And so uh, it, it came out after the war when um, and men wrote about it in, in letters and, and memoirs, uh, how horrified they were by the fact that, you know, some of them had known boys who were presented with white feathers so many times that they decided to go to the war office, uh, the recruiting station rather, and, and lie about their age, sign up and go off. And in some cases, of course, they were killed. So, and it was a strange reversal in the sense that um, the suffragette campaign was a campaign that was against the conservative establishment, whereas the white feather campaign was part of the establishment, uh, yet both were part of what some historians have seen as a, a deliberate, deliberately uh, provoked sex war. Uh, between men and women instigated by, by these women whose anger was such that they were willing to, 
to send men to their deaths uh, and to and really to say to them, and it was widely acknowledged that this was the case, that they faced an even worse death on the home front if they didn't go and face death from a bullet on the battle. And that death was, you know, the possibility of ever having a woman's love to be given a white feather was to be told that you were not worthy as a man to be loved. Not all men took it that way. There's stories of some guys uh, who just thought it was part of the natural order of things. So uh, there's a story of one man who uh, he was thinking of, of signing up, you know, lots of young men were, and um, he was given a white feather by a very attractive young woman at one point. Um, there was a conscription rally or something that was going on and he went off to sign up. And then a few days later, he went back to um, where the same woman was speaking and she saw him and recognized him and came over and gave him a kiss and he gave her the feather back and he laughed about it and saw it as, you know, that's just, that's just the way it was. Many other men didn't feel that it was funny or, or, um, acceptable really they they were appalled by the the cruelty of it and um yeah so um so that's interesting and and uh i i, I find it fascinating that that those aspects of um the uh, women's activism is 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 often downplayed i mean i've even seen some historians say that the, the women who got involved in the white feather campaign, that that was their one opportunity to exert power over men who had always, you know, exerted power over them. So often historians will try to justify what the women did by denying that they had any power and agency in their lives, even while they're dealing with an example of women exercising agency uh, in really, uh, um, one of the most aggressive possible ways. So yeah, it's um, it's, it's just a it's an interesting example, I think, of how this um, the the anger that can come from believing oneself a victim can uh, empower one or galvanize one uh, to engage in all sorts of acts of violence and, in the case of the White Feather campaign, cruelty, really. It's really so. reminiscent of what's going on these days. Um, so Christabel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Christabel a little bit and how she got involved in it. Mm -hmm. Well, Christabel, um, yes, was, was um, uh, she was at this time, you know, during the, the suffragette campaign, quite a young woman. She was born in 1880, I believe. So she would have been in her early 20s when she became involved in, in her mother's organization. And um, uh, she was, you know, again, uh, passionately committed to the cause and committed to this idea of representing men as the enemy in the, you know, most decided form. And to that end, she wrote a book that is pretty much considered, um, well, considered uh, responsible for turning the suffragette movement into an out and out sex war of women against men. Uh, that represented men in the most depraved light possible. And it was called The Great Scourge and How to End It. And out of that book came one of the suffragette mottos, which was votes for women, chastity for men. And so there it was made clear that the political campaign that was the suffrage movement was also a campaign to, uh, to denigrate and to control male sexuality altogether. And the great scourge in, uh, in, that, that uh, Pankhurst, Christabel Pankhurst is talking about was prostitution to a certain extent um, and specifically sexually transmitted disease. 
And there's a big history about sexually transmitted disease in, in English speaking countries generally in, in Great Britain in particular. I would try not to go into too much of the detail, but it was a very contested issue. Uh, obviously, there was uh, a concern amongst medical authorities about the spread of sexually transmitted diseases, particularly syphilis, which is most serious, gonorrhea as well. And it was serious enough and widespread enough, I guess. Nobody knows, you know, the exact numbers, but uh, you know, of people infected. But it was it was responsible for deformities and infertility and blindness in some cases. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible disease. And so there were attempts made to, um, to, to control it, partly by controlling prostitution because it was felt that it mostly spread as a result of prostitution. Now, the attitude towards prostitution amongst the general British public and authorities, I guess, was probably that it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a good thing, but it was understandable. And it was thought that it was connected with male sexual need. There was a kind of general understanding that men sometimes had sexual needs. And because there was so much of an emphasis in the 19th century on female sexual purity, it was thought that it was better that men use prostitutes. That was the least of the bad alternatives, essentially. So there were a series of, of acts that were enacted called the Contagious Diseases Acts, starting in 1864. And under these acts, any woman in a port town or a military town who was suspected of being a prostitute, just suspected, no evidence, she could be arrested uh, and then examined, uh, forcibly examined by medical personnel to see if she was infected. And if she was, she could be detained against her will until she was cured. And um, it was a terrible thing. Uh, and many people, many members of the British public were rightly appalled. It was an assault on civil liberties. It was, it was demeaning for the women. And many um, women campaigners in particular spoke out against it, especially against the, well, against uh, you know, how horrible it was for the women, but also against the double standards involved, whereby the men who were visiting the prostitutes, they were not themselves shamed and you know, de detained and examined, but the, the women were. And uh, many of them just you know, ordinary working class women had this terrible experience. And um, so, so, you know, for a number of years, these campaigns went on and many women uh, who became women's rights activists were involved. But in the course of that involvement, and, you know, and they were successful, ultimately, they, they spoke out against the practice, they, they articulated the injustice, they wrote to parliamentarians about it, and they swayed British public opinion, and eventually the acts were repealed and that practice was not carried on anymore. So that's a very interesting chapter of, of feminist activist history as well. But what was interesting too was how many feminists, um, like they, they, they took that idea that this was an injustice to women and they expressed their repugnance at prostitution, but they turned it into an all out condemnation of all men, even men who didn't use prostitutes, um, you know, it, it, it became their vehicle for expressing revulsion against male sexuality. And so rather than as was the sort of general feeling, the recognition of male sexual need, they said, no, 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 this has nothing to do with male sexual need. This is about men subordinating women this is about men using women as sexual objects. And in fact, many of them went further and said this prostitution and the problem of prostitution is a kind of metaphor for women's position in our society generally. And they said there were two types of prostitutes. There were women who were prostituted in marriage and there were women who were prostituted in sex work. They didn't call it that then, but, you know, and so basically they... They started making this equation, which had already been made by Marx and Engels earlier, uh, and, and you know it's still used to some extent that that 
all relations between men and women were a kind of prostitution. And that the problem was men. It had nothing to do with sexual desire. They never imagined that there might, like they never gave any kind of humane or even halfway empathetic account of why a man might visit a prostitute. They just saw it as an expression of male power in the basest form. And they said that only when women were at last enfranchised and empowered could they bring an end to this kind of thing. And always implicit in their arguments, and this is very clear in Christabel Pankhurst's, Pankhurst's work, uh, Great Scourge and How to End It, very clear was the idea that women were morally superior to men and that it was necessary for women to tame men and to control them. And I think that element in feminist anger at alleged male sexual brutality, you know, it became a really uh, important, like a key note of feminist discourse about men. And so you really see that in, in Pankhurst's book. It's, and it, I, I really recommend it for, for anybody who wants to see something of the sort of the, the, the root articulation of feminist anger at alleged male sexual degradation. It, she, you know, I'll, I can read a tiny bit of it. It's, it's, uh, it's quite something. Um, at one point she says, oh, and, and just before I read this, it's interesting too that she, she repeatedly rejected the idea that there was anything biological in male sexual need. She, she, so very much like today's social constructionists, although they didn't use that kind of phrasing, she said, no, 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 it, it, this is, there's, there's not, this is not a natural impulse. This is something that men do to themselves. They inflame their own lust by having impure thoughts. They allow themselves to think of women in degraded ways. Uh, they eat the wrong things, they drink too much, like it was all men's fault. And she even at one point in the book suggested that um, there was a type of medical castration, not actual castration, but through drugs that was practiced on men in prison. And that if men couldn't control themselves, they should be medically castrated. So it was, you know, this idea of the castrating feminist, it's, it's actually literally true. It's there in, in Pankhurst's book. She, she literally recommends that, that that be done, that men be medically castrated for their own good. So she said things like, um, uh, at one point in the book, she says, sexual disease is due to the subjection of women. It is due, in other words, to the doctrine that woman is, woman is sex and beyond that nothing. Sometimes this doctrine is dressed up in the saying that women are mothers and beyond that nothing. What a man who says that really means is that women are created primarily for the sex gratification of men and secondarily for the bearing of children if he happens to want them, but of no more children than he wants. And, and she goes on like that. Um, so, I mean, it's quite something to say that a man who uh, loves a woman because she is his wife and the mother of his children and who glorifies the female ability to have children and mother that that is just the other side of seeing women as nothing more than a sexual object to be used and discarded. But that is essentially what she was arguing. And so it, it's like, you know, the, the man can't win in this kind of situation unless he simply submits altogether to her ideology. If he says, I don't use prostitutes, I feel bad for women who prostitute themselves, I love my wife and, and you know, I'm happy that she's the mother of my children. I honor her for that. Well, she's going to say, well, that's just the same thing. That's just the other side of the coin. And she goes on in the same uh, book to say um, that the reason that, that men visit prostitutes, she says, the fact is that the sex instinct of these men 
has become so perverted and corrupted that intercourse with virtuous women does not content them. They crave for intercourse with women whom they feel no obligation to respect. They want to resort to practices which a wife would not tolerate. Lewdness and obscenity is what these men crave and what they get in houses of ill fame. So again, you know, just uh, the most degraded and unsympathetic view possible of all male sexual feeling. The idea that a man might crave uh, sex because he craves physical intimacy, because he wants loving touch, because that is a deep need, was completely foreign to Pankhurst and to all those who adopted that kind of idea. And, uh, you know, and so her emphasis was very much on the notion that, that really women should, and I think the, the implication was women should not only be e equal, this runs throughout much of, of feminist theorizing, women should not only be equal, equality was never of great interest, only sometimes, that women should actually be able to control men in all aspects of their lives. And because women were better, they were morally superior, they, were, they, had, um, they didn't have lust, they, uh, you know, they weren't tempted in the ways that men were, they had far greater self-control, and therefore they would be better at nearly anything that they put their minds to. And of course, it's interesting that that notion that women were better because they were sexually more pure that notion didn't carry through in feminism. When we get to second wave feminism, we find lots of women declaring that, you know, women have the exact same sexual needs as men. They, they start doing their slut walks. They start advocating that women should have just as many sexual partners. They should be free. They shouldn't be ever be shamed for what they do. And even at the time, of course, as we've talked about, there were advocates of free love, you know, who, who promoted the idea that, that women had sexual desires and that that should be validated and encouraged and sexual pleasure for women was very important. So that aspect of the uh, ideology that Pankhurst was promoting, it didn't really last. It, 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 uh, it was rejected by later feminists. She would have been surprised, I think, to see women marching in the slut walk and declaring that they're right. Um, but the deep uh, contempt expressed for men generally and for men's sexuality. That part did stay. That's common, I think, now in most feminist discussions about the relationship between men and women. It's even maybe obligated to express horror at male sexual brutality. So, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's her. Hurst. That's her. Man, man. So what was her... I have to ask, what was her relationship with her father? I think it was good. Um, of course, he died when she was fairly young. No, not really, no. Um, he died when, when she was in her teens. So and I think, I, I don't really know that much about it. She was named Christabel because they thought she was you know, going to be this really beautiful, brilliant young woman. I think she was adored by her father, as far as I can tell. And was Sylvia older or younger than Christabel? Younger, yeah. Christabel younger. was the oldest. So, so Sylvia mm. broke with her mother and sister over the militancy of the suffragettes. She felt that um, the women's movement should be more focused on the problems of working class people in general. She was attracted more to socialism and she became a socialist, really. And, and uh, she felt that the militancy did not achieve any ends at all. It was simply an expression of, you know, irrational hatred. And uh, I think she was right about that. She wrote a, a biography of her mother and sister and of the movement, which expressed her disagreement with its violent tactics. So she was an interesting person as well. And Adela also broke with the movement over its violence and the rift there between Emmeline the mom and Adela was so severe that uh, the, the 
the story is anyway that that um, her mom gave Adela a 20 pound note and a ticket to Australia. And she went to Australia and there became involved in various causes and started a life for herself and never communicated with her mother or her sister Christabel again. So, um, but she too was interested in, in left-wing causes. And uh, Christabel ended up leaving England. She had to leave England. Correct? She left England in the final years before the war, and she returned once the once the war began. She left England to avoid imprisonment for her various illegal activities. Yeah. And did she end up with some sort of religious um, affiliation? Was yes. that Christabel? Yeah, I haven't, and I've never followed this through, but it's fascinating. And, you know, the same thing happened with Emmeline, in a way, after being radically on the left and, and, you know, really interested in all this militancy and revolutionary ideals, she became quite conservative in her later age. She joined the Conservative Party. This is another thing that the historians don't talk about because it's such a strange transformation in a way. And yes, same thing happened with Christabel, and I have not researched this, but she became involved in Seventh-day Adventism, which I don't know very much about the Seventh-day Adventists, except that they're very, you know, passionate evangelicals, evangelical Christians. And yeah, so so she too, in a way, uh, rejected her earlier kinds of activism and, and ideology, which perhaps suggests that these were people who, well, that partly they're looking for causes. You know, there are many people who, who feel strongly that they need something to devote their life to and to sacrifice their lives for. And um, feminism is a, is a very uh, attractive one, I think, for, for many women. So, but, mm -hmm. but yeah. At the political level, yeah. At the political but, level, yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting that they went to a spiritual level at, they find they finally went down and i can see that being uh i can see that being an end result because that may have been what they were looking for all along but they positioned themselves politically not realizing uh the the depth of the problem well i i you know i think you're absolutely right and um in, you know, in a way, feminism is a religion, except that it's a secular one, as are many other, you know, Antifa is a, is a religion as well. Um, but it's about bringing the kingdom, the ideal utopian um, revolutionary society of perfection. It's about bringing that in the here and now. It can't be put off. You can't accept injustice because you don't believe that there is any other life. And, and it fuels radicalism, because you then believe that unless you bring it now, you will never experience it. And this is all there is. So if you are a passionate radical, and if you have a deep longing that all the wounds of the world, all the tears need to be dried, you will be willing to do nearly anything and sacrifice yourself even in violent causes. Um, but if you believe that there is something more, that there is an afterlife where the tears can be dried, where things are made right at last, you can endure injustice in a, in a different kind of mindset altogether. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there is a spiritual hunger often at the basis of a great deal of social radicalism. Yeah, 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 I'm sure there is. The difference is that I think, I mean, the, the thing that makes social, like secular radicalism so dangerous is that unlike with most spiritual practices or religions, um, maybe with the exception of Islam, but I don't want to really get into it, but um, there, there is an injunction not to hate. The injunction is that hatred is spiritually really damaging. And so mm -hmm. um, I think most adherents of religion, although they can certainly act very hatefully, the, the religion usually tries to, to put some sort of break on it, you know, tries to redirect the negative aspects of humanity into, into self-reflection and practices of empathy or indeed self-sacrifice, but part of that self-sacrifice is sacrificing one's desire for revenge. Certainly in Christianity, you know, vengeance is mm -hmm. mine, saith the Lord, all, all that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And, and um, mm -hmm. 
but but if you don't, if there is, if all you have is your secular belief system, then you can hate, and there's no reason not to, because you believe that whoever, you know, whatever institution it is, whatever group of people is causing the injustice that you so passionately want to end, you have to hate that because not to would be that you aren't as committed to your vision of, of righteousness and, and justice. So yeah, it's, um, it's very, it is a very interesting. Wow, that it just so much reminds me of what's going on today. It's, mm -hmm. it, it hasn't changed. It doesn't hasn't seemed to have changed. No, it's uh, you know, its purpose and its uh, direction. It's very similar. Well, and and that is yeah. I mean, I feel that too. That that's the thing that continually interests me when I started reading the words of these activists and reading about what they did and. Yeah, you know, it's a, we're a hundred years later, more than that, even in some cases, and yet the attitudes are so incredibly similar. And um, yeah, there was something I was going to say just in response to, to what you were just saying about the similarities. But I, well, I think it, it's that, like, it, it's because. It's the danger of a revolutionary ideal, I think, because the revolution never ends. Like it, it, it never does achieve its ends because mm -hmm. human beings are deeply flawed. Of course, revolutionaries don't tend to believe that. They think that, that human beings can be perfected. If we just take away the things that are corrupting human beings, we can make them perfect and we can have a perfect society. But it never happens. So the revolution is just continual in that there are always injustices, there's always suffering that one can be appalled by and desire to end. And again, I think that's where, you know, a religious understanding, a spiritual understanding is, is different because it recognizes that that is the perennial human condition. And yes, you do work to try to reform things, but a reform ideology is different from a revolutionary one because it doesn't believe that there will ever be perfection in human affairs. And that drive to take away all pain and all suffering, it leads to so much more suffering then because it can't content itself with the reality of, of, of human, of the flawed nature of humanity. So when you when you were you were a teacher of women's studies for a long time, well of English, but um, with a yeah with a feminist kind of emphasis. I see. Yeah. And so and all the all the reading that you've done since I think it was two thousand and fifteen or two thousand and fourteen when you decided that you were going to look at it differently. How how was your training different from what you? No, now it was entirely different it, it was yeah it, it the 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 things that i found were simply not they were not foregrounded in the feminist criticism that i read why do you why do you think it was missing i think it's because um feminist critics are ideologically motivated. They've already decided when they begin their scholarship that what they want to do is celebrate feminist foremothers, celebrate the women who went before. They still believe that women are, I think most feminists believe that women are innocent and badly treated and that women are not responsible for most of the things that have you know, gone wrong in the world and that men are responsible for those things. Boy, well, you know, that, that makes women really, uh, weak, weak, yeah. weak willed. Yeah. <laughs> right? it, 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 I mean, it does, but that's not how they see them. Uh, fem, I, you know, when I was a feminist, I thought that women were very strong, but that they had been held down, you know, through centuries of oppression and they had struggled and struggled and struggled. And this is the story about the suffragettes and all the other feminist activists. They had struggled mightily against injustice and they had achieved good things. Of course, there's still more to be achieved. And men are still oppressing women. And, um, and there's all sorts of other kinds of oppression as well. That comes in with intersectional feminism, of course. It isn't just 
men against women, it's white people against all other people and, you know, heterosexual people against queer people and all of that. And, but, but, um, so once you be, decide that that is your ideology <clears throat> and, and if you believe it passionately, which uh, I, that's the nature of ideology is to, to, uh, to be polarizing and to present a, a, a binary view of the world, the world divided into oppressor and oppressed. So if you believe that, you're not going to be interested in the details, the, the, the details of the flawed humanity of the people that you're, you're you know, studying or analyzing or teaching. Because why would you be? That is secondary to the larger cause of justice that you want to be part of. And that's why academia then, it's no longer about the pursuit of truth, the dispassionate analysis and studying and researching. It's about purveying an ideology. And, and, and that is deeply believed in. These people, um, like they, they, um, they really believe that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. As Herbert Marcuse declared in his 1965 essay, Repressive Tolerance, if you tolerate the status quo, you are really engaged in repressing people that you should be helping to be liberated. So when you're analyzing, uh, let's say the 19th century suffragettes, you want to focus on the good things they did. You want to downplay their flaws. And, you know, the fact they set off a few bombs, well, you wouldn't want to really emphasize that because then that's going to tarnish their reputation. It's going to make the movement look bad. You know, that, I mean, they'd have a more sophisticated explanation or they genuinely believe that what everything they did was justified and they're not going to emphasize the lives that could have been lost, their reckless indifference, their arrogance, their lack of concern for working men, the fact that their lives were actually quite protected compared to many of the men that those suffragettes knew and interacted with. They're not going to emphasize any of that because that will take away from the righteousness of the cause. And that will potentially inhibit others, young people today at universities from taking up that same cause. And they want them to take up that cause because they believe in it really deeply. Just like if you were, you know, trying to, well, if, if you're trying to convince anyone of anything, you're not going to emphasize the negatives of it. You're going to emphasize its glories. And so that, that's what, you know, I'm embarrassed to say now that I, uh, there are all sorts of things I didn't know when I was pursuing a PhD. I was, I wasn't a historian. I was looking at, um, uh, women writers of the of late 19th century in Canada, mainly. And, and most of those, they were journalists and, and, uh, essayists and, um, social activists. And one was a politician. And one of them wrote, wrote a regular column promoting women's rights. Her name was Flora McDonald Dennison. She was a fascinating woman. And she wrote about Emmeline Pankhurst. Uh, she was actually instrumental in bringing Pankhurst to Toronto to speak in 1909. These activists, you know, they moved across the Atlantic. They, they had networks in various English speaking countries. And so I had to research Pankhurst a little bit just to know what my author was talking about. And I had no idea about the bombing campaign. You know, I, I just read the basic stuff. I knew that they smashed windows, I think, but you know, I figured, wow, that's justified. And um, <laughs> I knew they went to prison and I figured they just went to prison because you know, those, the nasty police state wanted to put them in prison. Like I didn't, I just didn't investigate all aspects of the subject. And similarly, I didn't realize that there were men in both Canada and Great Britain who did not have the right to vote at the time that the suffrage activists were advocating. And I never, you know, imagine that. Like, it's terrible. And, you know, to, uh, to justify my ignorance, I guess nobody ever said to me, <laughs> you know, this via bingo, you are uh, writing without full understanding. You know, you need to consider X, Y, and Z. Um, I'm not sure why no one did. Maybe they didn't know either. No, well, nobody was doing that. I mean, that that's it. Right? You, you, no, not, not really. Um, I mean, some serious historians always wrote about it, but 
Yeah, the, the, the whole investigation in academia has, has generally since, I'd say, the 1980s or even a bit sooner, um, has, 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 it's bent towards activism. It's mm-hmm. become advocacy scholarship rather than actual scholarship. And as soon as you get involved in advocacy, you're not really interested. Well, you're certainly not disinterested. You're not objective. You're, you're, you're trying to support a position through your scholarship. And, and then that necessarily. Yeah, that's smashed. manipulative, isn't mm-hmm. it? You're, yeah. you're looking for the details that will help you um, create a particular vision of the past. Yeah. Bolster your argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's uh, one sided. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, good for you for looking into it, though, because there's so much to know. It's very interesting. There's so much. Yeah. So much that I still don't know. And yeah, it's, it's exciting. I mean, I really wish that we could put together an army. I mean, we need a huge army, but even a small army just investigating the feminist angle. It's like, you know, everyone today thinks they know at least a little something about feminism and that little that they think they know is almost completely wrong. I remember I went like years ago now, I went, I had a brief clip, a disastrously bad one on uh, Good Morning Britain. And it was when Pierce Morgan was was on the show. They wanted me on there because there was this scandal right then about a young fellow who's an American guy named Anthony Johnson. And he was hosting a conference called Make Women Great Again. And, uh, you know, this caused scandal. Who says women aren't great? And who's going to tell women how to be great? So so, uh, Anthony Johnson and I were invited on to... Good morning, Britain. And right at the top, Pierce Morgan said to me, I only had like two minutes to speak and I fluffed it, but he said, my heroine is Emmeline Pankhurst. She is my ideal. Uh, That was a true woman's rights activist. She wanted equality. That's what she wanted. And that was my ideal of feminism. And, you know, at that point, I, I knew who Emmeline Pankhurst was, but I did not know all the stuff that I know now. And if I could only have said, why do you, why do you idealize a terrorist? That mm-hmm. would have been a really good intervention, but I didn't know <laughs> enough then to, to call her a terrorist, although Simon Webb had done a lot of his research at that point. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I went off on another tack and it wasn't a very fruitful discussion very brief and I don't think I made my point but you know that like that's the idea like she there is a statue to her so why wouldn't you lionize her I bet 99.5 percent of Britons even those who are interested in British history have no idea about the bombing campaign and so that's you know like that's it and then you know beyond that how many have read the great scourge and how to end it and have seen those expressions, you know, the vilification of all men as sexually, uh, sexual predators who, who need to have their lusts controlled. Like nobody knows it. And it, it, it helps us to understand where we are now because people often say, well, the first wave movement was good. Those women were, you know, they were good women and that it went wrong just recently. No, Yes, some of the things they did were good and there were, you know, they had some issues that that deserved to be fought for. But no, there was a great deal of hatred even then. And we need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. We definitely need to be aware of that. And you're helping to do that. And I very much appreciate it. I always look forward to speaking with you because I know I'm going to learn something new and we're going to tell the people who are listening, they're, they're going to learn things too. Well, thank, thank goodness. you. Well, thanks thank a lot. It's, it's really fun for me to be able to share some of the things that I'm learning Good. and and I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. Oh, well, I sure do. And we'll speak again soon. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Thanks, Janice. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.